Okay, last video for first semester, we're going to talk about the age of exploration. Let's get started. Okay, so from the 1400s to the 1700s, Europe's going to experience this age of exploration. And the Renaissance is going to encourage this curiosity and a desire for trade. So as a result of this exploration, European nations are going to grow really powerful and spread influence throughout the world. Okay. So one of the things that they were, were motivating them to do this age of exploration was gold or money. Usually what motivates everyone. Basically the whole world revolves around money, right? That's a big reason for why they wanted to explore. So a desire for new sources of wealth was the main reason for this European exploration. So merchants began looking for quick, direct trade routes to Asia, trying to avoid Muslim and urgent merchant, Muslim and Italian merchants, and increase profits. So the Crusades and the Renaissance stimulated the European desire for exotic Asian luxury goods. We talked about this last unit. So the other thing was glory. So kings who sponsored voyages of exploration gained overseas colonies, new sources of wealth for their nation, and increased power. And exploration is going to present Europeans the opportunity to rise out of their poverty and gain fame, fortune, and status. Okay. And then we had... Then we had God. So European Christians, especially Catholics, wanted to convert to stop the spread of Islam and convert non-Christians to their faith. So again, part of what came out of the Crusades was this idea of being a missionary, trying to convert people to Christianity. So explorers were encouraged to, bring, to spread Christianity and bring missionaries who would focus only on conversion. Before the Renaissance, sail, sailors didn't really have the technology to sail pretty any far from Europe and return. Usually they weren't able to make it. They didn't have food, things that they could be stored and saved, and people just didn't really make it. But trade and cultural diffusion during the Renaissance is going to introduce new navigation techniques to Europeans. So you had things like the magnetic compass, which made sailing a lot more accurate. You also had maps, which were a lot more accurate and used things like longitude and latitude, made things easier to find. And you had things like the astrolab, which used stars to help show direction. So just a lot of different navigational things made it easier to travel safely and know you would actually make it back to where you left. And then you had things like European shipbuilders who wanted to build better ships. So the caravel was a strong ship that could travel in the open seas and in shallow water. So you could actually go to like where the beach is and dock your ship. So you had things like cannons and rifles, which gave ships protection. Because again, that was another thing when you were traveling out. Not only are you going to get lost, you're probably going to get shot by a cannon from an, from an invading tribe or, or from the Italian and Italian merchants, right? So these caravels also had triangular lateen sails that allowed ships to sail against the wind. So you could actually use these giant long sails and it'll help you be able to steer the ship better. It also had a removable rudder which made the caravel a lot more maneuverable. So Europeans were not the first to explore the ocean searching for trade routes. Islamic merchants came first actually and they're going to explore the Indian Ocean and they dominated a lot of that Asian spice trade for centuries, hundreds of years, before the European exploration. So the Muslims were already way ahead of the Europeans, but the Europeans like to say that they were the first. But as we learned about earlier, in like these Islamic empires, they're the ones who actually created the compass and create a lot of those navigational skills the Europeans claim to have created. Okay. So from about 1405 to 1433, Zheng He led the Chinese treasure fleet on seven different expeditions throughout Southeast Asia, India, and Africa during the time of the Ming Dynasty in China. But in the late 1400s, you had European sailors that did what neither Muslim nor Chinese explorers could, which was they began this global exploration to create colonies to increase their wealth and power. So they're going to go all the way from Europe all the way to different continents over in the Western Hemisphere. And you're going to go to places like North and South America. So some of these different, uh, different examples. In Portugal, Prince Henry the Navigator started this school of navigation to try and train sailors to be able to go and explore all these places. He's going to bring in Europe's best map makers, their shipbuilders, and sailing instructors. And he really wanted to discover new territories, find a quick, quick trade route to Asia, and really try to expand the power of Portugal. And Portugal's the lead leader in the age of exploration during this time. Okay. So, 
Prince Henry's navigation school and his willingness to fund these voyages are going to lead the Portuguese to be the first to explore the west coast of Africa. So they're going to make it all the way across to the other side of Africa, which is pretty good at the time. And this is going to be led by this guy named Vasco da Gama. And he's going to be the first explorer to find a direct trade route to Asia by going all the way around the entire continent of Africa to get to the, to the eastern side. So because of this, Portugal is going to gain a sea route to Asia that's going to bring them a lot of wealth. So during this age of exploration, Portugal is also going to create colonies along the African coast, as well as in Brazil and in Asia. So again, the start to colonization. So the Spanish government saw Portugal's wealth and just really didn't want to be left out. They wanted to get in on the game of making the monies. So more than any other European monarch, they, you had these two people, Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain. They're the two leaders, or the king, of, the king and queen of Spain, who are going to sponsor and support these different overseas expeditions. And one of the main expeditions that they are going to fund is a guy you learned about. Like I said, we were going to eventually get to him good guy named Christopher Columbus. So like most of the educated men of the Renaissance, Columbus, Columbus is going to believe that the world was round and that it's not flat. And again, this is where we get to that issue of, is the world flat? I don't know. Columbus says it's not, and people thought he was crazy. But like we talked about before, Columbus was not the first person to invent that theory. That happened in ancient China. But okay, we won't go there. So Columbus said that he could reach Asia by selling west. People said, you're crazy, man. You gotta go east, because it's flat, and you'll never make it. You're gonna fall off the earth. And he, he said, no, I'm gonna make it. So he goes west. He's gonna end up reaching the, what's now the modern-day Bahamas in America. And he thought that he'd reach the islands off the coast of India. So he's like, oh, cool, I made it to India. But now he just made it to the Bahamas. You know, just cruise, like all the cruise ships. He did not make it that far. So he made four trips to this place that he called India, never knowing he was actually in modern day, the modern day Caribbean part of America. Okay. So despite the fact that Columbus never found Asia, Ferdinand Magellan still thought he could reach Asia by selling west. So Magellan's going to be the next guy to try it. And he's going to end up being the first one to go all the way around the earth. So he'll actually be successful. He's going to make it through the entire globe, thus proving the earth is not flat because Magellan found out. There you go. So during this age of exploration, Spain's going to create these different colonies in North and South America. So you have different guys that we'll talk about. Um, again, there's good and bad to all things. Uh, the idea of bringing all the germs and enslaving all of the people is so cruel. I mean, there's no way to comprehend it. Yes, did they bring some more things to America? You know, so... Yes, but so there's there's good and bad to all things. You can't just say Cortez, who conquered the Aztecs, is completely evil. We don't know that. Maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. We were not there, so we can't for sure say. Uh, can we say that slaughtering thousands of people was absolutely terrible? Absolutely. And from those parts of information, we can say Cortez probably was not a great guy. Okay. And again, it's all about perspective. I don't want you guys to say, oh yeah, Cortez is the worst. We don't know this. Okay. So Spain's going to send these, send these different explorers called conquistadors to the New World. Then they're going to find gold, they're going to claim land, and they're going to spread Christianity. So like I said, Cortez conquered the Aztecs. Uh, you had this guy named Pizarro. He's going to go and conquer the Incas. The in influx of this gold is going to make Spain one of the most powerful countries in Europe during the early years of the Age of Exploration. And again, we don't really talk as much on here about what that did to the native people, but basically it effectively destroyed all of the civilizations in the new world and they're going to be replaced by these European explorers. Okay. So after Spain and Portugal got involved, some of the other countries were like, we want a part of it too. So England, France, and the Netherlands are also going to become involved in overseas exploration and colonization. So you had this French explorer named Samuel de Champlain who's going to search Canada for a northwest passage to Asia. And after he's unable to do that, and he says, okay, I guess I can't get through, he's going to found the French colony of Quebec. That's going to be the start of Canada. We'll learn a little about the Canadians. Yeah. So the French is going to soon carve out a large colony along the Mississippi River from Canada all the way down to New Orleans. This is an area that's going to be purchased by the Louisiana Purchase uh, by Thomas Jefferson. Those of you guys who listen to Hamilton, we're getting into that time period. We're only like two units away. Get hyped. 
So unlike other European nations whose kings paid for colonies, the English colonies were paid for by citizens who formed this joint stock. So people who went to and like got all of their money together and said, we are going to use this money to send us a group of people over to start colonizing the Americas. So these English colonies are going to form along the Atlantic coast by North America by colonists who are going to be motivated either by religion, maybe their, their religion is feeling attacked in England and they feel like they need to move over to the Americas where they have more freedom, or by wealth, they want to make money. So the English explorer James Cook is going to be the first European to make contact with Australia, New Zealand, and Hawaii. And like England, you then also had the Dutch, who allowed private companies to fund exploration. And they had colonies both in America and Africa, but the Dutch East India Company is going to dominate a lot more of the trade over in Asia. So some of the conclusions. As a result of the age of exploration, European knowledge and influence is going to really increase and this is just going to lead to a lot of different things. Again, we don't really talk on this, at, at least not in this video, as much about some of the off, truly awful things that happened as a result of colonization. I think it's something that needs to be talked about a lot more because, again, it was just, it was, it, it was absolutely awful. Okay. We'll talk about it a little bit more in class, though. I don't want to bum you guys out. This is the last video I have for this unit, though. So I'll see you guys for another video next semester. All right. Bye, guys. Happy holidays.